The salt-laced wind whipped my hair, the air thick with the smell of brine and something else, something darker, something ominous. It clung to me, a tangible presence in the heavy, starless night. A veil of mist, drawn by the relentless roar of the ocean, clung to the cliff face, obscuring the view of the vast, churning sea. I was alone, the last human sentinel on this deserted stretch of Waimea Bay, a place known for its raw, untamed beauty and its unforgiving wrath. My hands, slick with sweat, gripped the rough wooden ladder, the steps creaking beneath my weight. With each step, the gale intensified, the waves crashing against the shore with a fury that shook the very foundations of the lifeguard post. The rhythmic thrum of the ocean, normally a comforting lullaby, had morphed into a terrifying beat, a primal drumbeat of destruction. I reached the top, the lookout platform swaying precariously. The wind screamed in my ears, tearing at my throat. Beneath my feet, the wooden structure groaned, protesting the relentless assault of the sea. From up here, the expanse of the ocean was a black, churning abyss, dotted with white caps that exploded in a spray of phosphorescent foam. Fear, cold and sharp, clawed at my insides. I had chosen this post, seeking solace in the solitude, a chance to escape the claustrophobic city for the open arms of the ocean. But tonight, the ocean felt anything but welcoming. It was a monster, its anger unleashed. A chilling wind, laden with the scent of salt and wet sand, swept across my face. It felt like a death knell, an icy warning. I glanced back at the deserted beach, the sand shimmering under the anemic moonlight. The emptiness amplified the fear, the eerie silence punctuated only by the relentless roar of the waves. It's just adrenaline, I muttered to myself trying to calm the hammering in my chest. It's nothing you can't handle. But my words were hollow. Deep down, a primal fear, the deep-rooted fear of the unknown, was whispering a warning. The ocean was angry, and its anger was directed at me. The wooden platform beneath my feet lurched, the rusted bolts holding it to the post screaming in protest. Panic tightened its grip, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I had to get down, get out of this monstrously swaying death trap. I scrambled down the ladder, each step a desperate fight against the wind. As my feet hit the sand, a wave, colossal and monstrous, reared its head, its crest topped with a crown of white foam that gleamed ominously in the moonlight. It seemed to pause, a moment of suspended horror, before crashing down upon the lifeguard post. The roar was deafening, the impact of violent tremor that shook the very ground beneath my feet. I watched, gripped by a horrifying fascination, as the monstrous wave engulfed the structure, splintering wood, twisting steel, and sending a torrent of debris into the churning sea. Then, it was over. The wave, its fury spent, retreated back into the deep, leaving behind a silence so profound it was almost deafening. I stood paralyzed, the weight of what I had seen settling on my shoulders like a leaden cloak. The lifeguard post, my sanctuary, my refuge, was gone, swallowed by the tempestuous ocean. A wave of nausea washed over me, the fear, so overwhelming, I choked back a scream. The fear of the ocean, it was not a mere fear, but a primal, instinctual terror, a recognition of the raw, untamed power of the sea, its indifference to human existence. The night was colder now, the wind carrying the bitter tang of salt and the faint scent of something rotten. It was a smell of death, of destruction, of the ocean's relentless power. I stumbled away, my legs heavy with fatigue, my mind a whirlwind of disbelief and fear. I had witnessed the ocean's fury, the raw, unbridled power that could swallow a man whole, without a moment's hesitation, without a flicker of remorse. The stars, hidden behind the curtain of mist, seemed to mock me, their distant light offering no comfort. The wind howled, a mournful dirge, its chilling notes, resonating through my very bones. I knew then, with a chilling certainty, that the true horror of Waimea Bay had only just begun. As I staggered away, my footsteps echoing in the eerie silence, I knew I was not just fleeing the desolation of the beach, but the weight of the truth, the undeniable knowledge that the ocean was not a benevolent force, but a powerful, unyielding entity that could claim its victims with ease. The fear gnawed at me, a relentless, persistent presence that refused to be dismissed. The ocean, a monster I had underestimated, had shown me its true face, its indifference, 
its terrifying power. And I knew, as I ran, that this was only the beginning. The ocean was a wild, untamed beast, and tonight, it had tasted blood. The beach stretched before me, a long, desolate expanse of sand and sea. The ocean, dark and churning, seemed to be closing in, its vastness and its power pressing down upon me, a relentless, menacing force. I ran, driven by a fear I had never known, a desperation that fueled my every step. Behind me, the ocean roared, its voice a thunderous, ominous growl. And the fear, it was real, it was present, it was a tangible thing, a cold, heavy weight pressing down upon my soul. A strange feeling of detachment filled me, a sense of being caught in a nightmare from which I could not wake. It felt like stepping into a world beyond reason, a world where the rules of nature were suspended, where the laws of man were meaningless. The wind cut through my clothes, turning my skin to goose flesh despite the humid air. The air was thick with the scent of salt, with the tang of something ancient and powerful. It was the smell of the ocean, of its vastness and its fury, and I knew, with a chilling certainty, that I was not alone. I forced myself to look back, to see if the lifeguard post was still there, a beacon of hope in this terrifying landscape. But there was nothing. Just the endless expanse of the ocean, dark and churning, its surface a rippling, angry reflection of the storm within. I turned and ran, I had to get away, I had to escape the unforgiving wrath of the sea. But as I fled I knew that I was already changed. I had been touched by the ocean, by its power and its fury, and I could never be the same. The darkness of the night swallowed me whole, the ocean, a roaring, menacing presence, was always there lurking just beyond the edge of my vision. I ran, driven by a desperate need to escape, to find sanctuary from the storm that raged both within and without. But I knew that the true horror of Waimea Bay had only just begun. The waves, they were different now, their rhythmic crashing had become a menacing beat, their endless cycle an ominous reminder of the ocean's relentless power. I would never look at the ocean the same way again. Its beauty, once a source of solace, now seemed laced with a sinister undercurrent, a hidden threat that could emerge at any moment. I stumbled through the night, the sand stinging my feet, the wind whipping my hair. The taste of salt lingered on my lips, a grim reminder of the ocean's power. I was lost, alone, and everything I thought I knew about the world had been shattered. In the distance, a light flickered, a beacon of hope in the darkness. I stumbled towards it, my heart pounding in my throat, my breath ragged. As I approached, I saw it was a small, run-down shack, its windows boarded up, its paint peeling in the moonlight. But it was shelter, and in this night of terror, any shelter was a blessing. I stumbled through the doorway, collapsing onto the creaking floorboards. My body was numb with exhaustion, my mind reeling from the horror I had witnessed. The shack was cold, damp, and smelling of mildew and decay. But it was a refuge, a temporary respite from the relentless assault of the storm. In the darkness, I finally wept, tears streaming down my face, washing away the fear and the pain. I was broken, battered, but alive. I had survived the night, but I was forever changed, forever haunted by the memory of the lifeguard post, consumed by the furious ocean. As I drifted into a fitful sleep, the roar of the waves echoed in my ears, their rhythm a chilling reminder of the power of the sea. I knew that the ocean would always be there, its vastness a constant presence, its fury a reminder of the power of nature and the fragility of human life. And I knew, with a terrifying certainty, that the true horror of Waimea Bay had only just begun. My wife, Mia, and I were driving cross-country. It was our first attempt at the Great American Road Trip. We had been together for five years, a testament to our ability to withstand long car rides, bickering over music choices, and an unhealthy obsession with finding the perfect diner. This trip, though, felt different. Maybe it was the sunbleached landscape of the Midwest stretching endlessly before us, or perhaps it was the sense of adventure that crackled in the air like static electricity but a thrill ran through me that was more than just anticipation. We were leaving behind the familiar, the routine, and venturing into the unknown, together. Mia and I rented a small RV, more of a camper than a full-blown RV. 
We packed up a couple suitcases with plenty of room for any souvenirs and we hit the dusty trail. We weren't the stereotypical RV folks, though. We eschewed the bright colors and loud decals, opting for a faded green model that blended into the landscape. It was a testament to both our practical nature and our preference for understated adventures. We started our journey on the Mother Road, Route 66 driving south from Chicago until we connected to I-70 and shot straight west through Missouri. We took our time, stopping at quirky roadside attractions, dusty antique shops, and diners with menus promising. World famous. Pies. It was a feast for the senses, a constant barrage of sights, sounds, and smells unlike anything we'd ever experienced. In Missouri, we stumbled upon the world's largest cap gun, a behemoth of painted metal that stood proudly next to a gas station. Mia, being an architect, saw its absurd beauty, snapping photos like she was capturing a lost wonder of the world. I, on the other hand, saw a massive, impractical hunk of junk, yet I couldn't help but grin as we stood next to it, hands clasped, grinning like two kids at a carnival. We pressed on, weaving through cornfields and rolling hills, the road unfolding before us like a ribbon. In Kansas, we visited the Evil Knievel Museum, a veritable shrine to the daredevil with motorcycles suspended from the ceiling, and his famous leather jumpsuit enshrined behind glass. The museum, despite its kitsch, radiated a palpable sense of bravado, a testament to human ambition and sheer, unadulterated daring. Outside, on a makeshift track, we found the world's largest bell buckle, a massive chrome monstrosity that made even the cap gun look modest. The West was a stark contrast to the Midwest. The landscape, once full of manicured lawns and bustling highways, transformed into a tapestry of towering mesas, arid plains, and rugged mountains. In Wyoming, we found the Devil's Tower, a monolithic rock formation rising from the prairie like a giant finger pointing at the sky. It was a sight that stole our breath, a silent testament to the raw power of nature. In South Dakota, we stood at the edge of the Badlands, a desolate landscape sculpted by wind and water, a stark reminder of the Earth's untamed magnificence. The Badlands, however, held something more than the beauty of the natural world. They held an eerie silence, a pervasive stillness that clung to us like a shroud. It was a strange feeling, as if the landscape itself had witnessed things we could never imagine, events older than time itself. One afternoon, as we drove through the heart of the Badlands, a feeling of unease crept over me. It was subtle at first, a prickling sensation on the back of my neck, but it grew with each mile, becoming an oppressive weight on my shoulders. We had been driving for hours, the sun hanging low in the sky, casting long shadows across the barren landscape. The roads were deserted, the only sound the hum of our camper engine and the occasional squawk of a hawk circling overhead. Mia, oblivious to my growing sense of dread, was engrossed in a travel book, her lips moving silently as she read. She looked up, a confused frown creasing her brow. Something wrong, honey, she asked, her voice soft and concerned. I don't know, I said, unable to articulate the feeling that had taken root within me. There's something off about this place. Mia, ever the pragmatist, chose to dismiss my unease. It's probably just the landscape, she said, her voice laced with a hint of amusement. It's a bit dramatic. We're in the Badlands, after all. We continued driving, the shadows growing longer, the silence becoming more oppressive. Mia, sensing my discomfort, put on some music, her attempt to banish the creeping darkness. But it was no use. The feeling persisted, a constant, gnawing anxiety that wrapped around me like a constricting band. Then, just as suddenly as it began, we came upon a tunnel. It was unlike any tunnel we had ever seen before, cut through the rock with precise, almost unnatural symmetry. It was long and dark, its mouth gaping open like a maw, a forbidding silhouette against the setting sun. There were no lights, no signs, no indication of its purpose or origin. It looked prehistoric, abandoned, untouched by human hands. Mia glanced at me, her face mirroring my own confusion. What is that? She whispered, her voice barely audible over the roar of the engine. I swallowed hard, my throat suddenly dry. I don't know, I said, my voice hoarse. But something about it doesn't feel right. 
There was a moment of silence, broken only by the rumble of the engine. I felt a primal fear welling up within me, a deep-seated instinct that screamed at me to turn away, to run. But something compelled me to press on. We had come this far. We had to see what lay beyond that dark maw. We drove slowly toward the tunnel, the silence growing more intense with each passing second. The air grew colder, the shadows deeper, and a strange, almost tangible energy seemed to emanate from the tunnel's mouth. Just as we reached the entrance, the engine sputtered and died, the lights flickering and dying with a groan. The RV, our mobile haven, our shield against the unknown, had succumbed to the strange energy, its mechanical heart seizing up in the face of an unseen force. I felt a wave of panic wash over me, my breathing turning shallow and ragged. What do we do? Mia whispered, her voice tight with fear. There was no answer. The only sound was the wind, whistling through the tunnel like a mournful song. I felt the presence of something vast and ancient watching us, its gaze penetrating the darkness. We need to get out of here, I said, my voice shaky. I tried to restart the engine, but it was no use. The RV remained stubbornly inert, a lifeless husk in the darkening landscape. With a shared, silent resolve, we got out of the RV, closing the door behind us with a dull finality. The tunnel seemed to stretch forever before us, its mouth a gaping black hole swallowing the light of the setting sun. The air felt thick, heavy, as if it were laced with secrets too dark to be spoken. Hesitantly, my hand reaching for me as, I took a step toward the tunnel's mouth. A cold shiver ran down my spine as I crossed the threshold, the air growing colder, the silence more oppressive. The tunnel was dark, impenetrable, the air thick with the scent of damp earth and something else, something primal and vaguely unpleasant. As we walked further in, the faint glow of the setting sun faded away, the darkness deepening around us. The air grew heavy and heavy with a scent that made my stomach churn. It was a blend of decaying flora, damp earth, and something else, something that smelled of fear. The silence was absolute, broken only by the sound of our own footsteps, echoing off the smooth walls that seemed to stretch endlessly before us. We walked for what seemed like hours, but the tunnel never seemed to end. The darkness felt alive, closing in around us, suffocating us with its oppressive weight. Suddenly, I heard a sound, a low, guttural growl that echoed through the tunnel, bouncing off the walls, sending a shiver down my spine. It was a sound that chilled me to the bone, a sound of ancient, primordial terror. We stopped dead in our tracks, my heart pounding against my ribs like a frantic drum. I felt Mia's hand clench tighter in mine, her knuckles turning white with the force of her grip. I knew she was terrified, but she stood her ground, her fear masked by a resolute determination. The growl came again, closer this time, accompanied by the rustling of leaves and the crunching of gravel. I strained my eyes, trying to pierce the darkness, but it was no use. The tunnel's mouth seemed further behind us now, like a fading memory. We have to get out of here, I whispered, my breath catching in my throat. I know, Mia said, her voice barely audible over the drumming in my ears. We turned and began running, our feet pounding on the gravel floor. The tunnel seemed to shrink around us, the walls closing in, the darkness pressing down as if it were trying to crush us, bury us beneath its oppressive weight. The growl followed us, a menacing echo in the silence, growing louder and closer with each step we took. We were running for our lives, fleeing an unknown terror that lurked in the depths of that ancient tunnel. The air grew thick and heavy, the scent of fear choking us. I could feel the darkness seeping into our bones, draining our strength, eroding our resolve. Then, suddenly, the ground gave way beneath our feet. We stumbled, falling forward, tumbling down a steep incline. The tunnel was a blur of rushing air, jagged rock, and blinding darkness. We landed with a sickening thud, a wave of pain washing over me as I felt the ground tear into my skin. I struggled to my feet, dazed and disoriented, the tunnel around me spinning. I reached out for Mia, finding her hand cold and clammy in mine. We were alive but we were trapped. The darkness enveloped us, smothering us. What happened? Mia asked, her voice shaky. Through the darkness I could see the light of fear in her eyes. I don't know, 
I said, my voice hoarse. But we're not alone. And as we lay there, huddled together, the growl echoing in the darkness, I knew that we were trapped in a place far more horrifying than any landscape we had ever seen. There was something lurking in the shadows, something ancient and terrible, something that would never let us leave. The Florida sun, already hot at nine in the morning, beat down on the palmetto scrubland surrounding the sinkhole. The air hung heavy, thick with the scent of pine needles and decaying wood. I adjusted the straps of my dive gear, the weight of the tanks pulling at my shoulders. This was a classic Florida cave dive, the kind that got the adrenaline pumping. My buddy, Jake, was already suited up, his face a mask of focused intensity. He was the one who'd stumbled on this particular lead, a promising offset sink that might connect to a newly discovered cave system. Ready? I asked, checking my gauges. Jake nodded, his eyes gleaming with an excitement that matched my own. Let's do this. Our descent was a slow, rhythmic ballet, punctuated by the hiss of our regulators. The water, initially clear, quickly transformed into a swirling brown soup, the light fading into a murky twilight. We were diving blind, relying solely on the feel of the line Jake had laid and the occasional flash of our dive lights. The usual symphony of cave sounds, the drip, drip, drip of water, the soft swish of current, was muted, replaced by an unsettling silence. Suddenly, Jake stopped, his light flickering across a wall just a foot ahead. Whoa, check this out, he muttered, his voice muffled by the regulator. I swam closer, adjusting my light to illuminate the wall. It was unlike any cave formation I'd ever seen. An intricate pattern of mineral deposits, resembling swirling, elongated teeth, etched across the limestone. The effect was mesmerizing, a stark contrast to the otherwise mundane gray of the cave walls. Cool, huh? Jake asked, his voice tinged with awe. Almost looks like a giant mouth. His words echoed in the stillness of the sinkhole, each syllable a jarring dissonance. I glanced at Jake, a fleeting feeling of unease creeping up my spine. He seemed distracted, totally engrossed in the patterns on the wall. I couldn't help but feel a chill, a prickle of unease that had nothing to do with the cold water. From the depths, a low growl emanated, a sound that seemed to come from the very wall we were observing. The growl was soft, almost hesitant, but unmistakable. My eyes darted to Jake, his face frozen in a mixture of shock and disbelief. Then, the wall moved. The swirling pattern of mineral deposits twisted, its teeth elongated, transforming into a terrifying maw. The darkness within the mouth pulsed, revealing a pair of glowing, predatory eyes and a set of powerful jaws. A low, guttural roar, filled with menace, tore through the silence. Jake, his eyes wide with terror, was the first to react. He instinctively lurched backward, slamming into the line, the force of his movement pulling me with him. We scrambled backwards, the line taut between us, a frantic, desperate ballet of limbs and lights the growling presence of the beast hot on our heels. The line, our lifeline to safety, felt like a thread in our hands, a flimsy barrier between us and the creature that stalked us. Its powerful, undulating movements through shadows that danced menacingly on the cave walls, its menacing presence amplifying our fear a hundredfold. Reaching the surface felt like reaching paradise. We broke the surface, gasping for air, the cold water sending shivers down our spines. We'd never seen a gator that big, let alone one that lived in a sinkhole like this. The size of the beast was unnerving, as was its audacity. We were lucky. I watched as Jake, still shaking from the adrenaline rush, hauled the line for the second time, his eyes fixed on the water below. Well, he said finally, his voice hoarse. That sinkhole is officially off our exploration list. The encounter, while terrifying, wasn't entirely unwelcome. It was a stark reminder of the wild, unpredictable nature of the underwater world, a reminder that even in the seemingly sterile depths of a cave, danger lurked, waiting. It left us shaken, but not broken, a testament to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of the unknown. The next few days were a blur of activity. We spread the word about the gator, cautioning other divers to avoid the area. Our story, 
told with a mix of humor and trepidation, became the stuff of legend amongst the cave diving community. But the memory of that chilling encounter, the feeling of being hunted in the silent depths, lingered. Whenever I went exploring in the caves, the quiet darkness seemed to whisper a warning. It was a reminder that the beauty and mystery of the underwater world came at a price, a price paid in fear, respect, and a newfound awareness of the dangers that lurked in the shadows. The sinkhole remained off our exploration list, a silent testament to the power of nature, its depths concealing a chilling secret. It was a reminder of the precarious balance between the human desire for discovery and the primal forces of the natural world. However, even as fear gripped us, we knew this was not the end. It was merely a chapter in an ongoing narrative, a story that was still unfolding. We would continue to explore, to push the boundaries of the known, to seek out the hidden wonders of the underwater world. But we would do so with a newfound respect for the dangers that lay hidden within, with a silent prayer for a safe return. The darkness of the cave would forever hold the memory of that chilling encounter, a reminder of the day we found ourselves face to face with the ultimate predator a creature as ancient as the cave itself, a creature that claimed the sinkhole as its own. For me, the memory of that dive wasn't just about fear, but about resilience. It was a reminder that even in the face of terrifying odds, the human spirit could rise above. It was a testament to the bonds of friendship, the trust we had in each other, the shared will to survive. And that, I knew, was the only way we could truly face the unknown, the only way we could truly explore the wonders of the world beneath the waves. The day started like any other, the familiar hum of the refrigerator, the smell of toast wafting from the kitchen, the quiet click of the TV turning on. I was ten, a preteen adrift in a sea of cartoons and boredom, homesick from school with a headache that felt like a nail hammered into my skull. My dad had already left for work, and Mom, bless her soul, was in the midst of a particularly challenging phone call with a work client. The world outside, bathed in the hazy morning light, felt as distant as the moon. I settled on the living room couch, the only furniture that comfortably held my aching body, and became a prisoner of the flickering screen. Then, the doorbell rang. It wasn't the usual chime, the soft melodious sound that announced a friendly visit. This was a sharp, insistent buzz like a fingernail scraping across a chalkboard. My first thought was that it was a telemarketer, but something about the urgency in the tone felt off. I peered through the blinds, my heart already drumming a nervous rhythm. It was a man, dressed in a faded brown uniform, his face obscured by the harsh glare of the sun. My instinct told me something was wrong. Hello? I called out, my voice small and shaky. Hey there, kiddo. He called back his voice unexpectedly jovial. Got a package for you. Big one, needs a little help. The package. My blood ran cold. The mailman, the one who always brought lollipops, the reason I eagerly awaited his arrival, was not due until later in the week. This man, he was different. Something felt off, like a wrong note in a familiar tune. Where's your truck? I asked, my voice barely audible. There was no truck parked in front of our house, no familiar blue and white vehicle with the USPS logo. Around the corner, he said, his smile too wide, too bright. Just need a hand. You're strong, right? The regular mailman usually brings the lollipops, I said, trying to buy myself some time, my mind racing. How could I be sure? The man had a uniform, a package. He's visiting family, he said, his voice impatient. Now, come on, open the door. I can't wait all day. He kept pushing. He kept smiling. I knew, in my gut, something was wrong. I don't feel well, I said, my voice gaining strength. Mom said I need to stay inside. Oh, come on, he said, his voice losing its pleasant edge. He was starting to look frustrated. This package is for your mom. She's going to be mad if you don't help out. The house felt constricted the walls closing in, the air thick with the smell of fear. My head ached, my muscles tensed. I needed to think, to act. I could get my shoes and come out, I said, my voice stalling, my mind desperately seeking a way out. Just need to get them from my room. 
Hurry up, he said, his voice low, a hint of menace creeping into his words. He was getting impatient. This is going to take a while if you keep wasting time. I closed the door, my fingers trembling as I locked it. My heart pounded like a drum in my chest. What was I doing? Why couldn't I simply run? But my legs felt like lead, rooted to the spot. I ran through the house, a whirlwind of anxiety and fear, locking the back door, my hands shaking. Then I ran to the phone, my fingers fumbling for the dial tone. I heard a distant voice on the other end, Hello? I need you, right now, my voice cracked, barely a whisper. Please come over. There's a bad man at my door. I think he's a fake mailman. Okay, sweetie, I'm coming, Mrs. Patterson, my neighbor and a family friend, said, her voice calm and steady. I hung up the phone, my fingers trembling as I locked the front door again. I stood at the locked door, peering through the small window pane, my eyes fixed on the man. He was still there, looking back at me. He seemed surprised, his smile gone. He was even more unsettling now, a predator trapped outside its cage, his eyes narrowed. Did you find your shoes? He said, his voice a low growl. Yep, and my neighbor, Mrs. Patterson, is coming to help me carry it, I said, my voice surprisingly strong. I was surprised myself. But the fear had been replaced by something else, a fiery determination, a need to protect myself. The man, his eyes now flashing, looked at me, then turned away, his shoulders slumping slightly. He looked around, checking to see if anyone else was watching. Then he turned back towards the street, his gait almost desperate, and ran. The minutes were an eternity. I watched him run away, his figure shrinking into the distance, until he was a mere speck in the vastness of the street. My heart was still pounding, but a strange feeling, almost like a victory, swelled inside me. Mrs. Patterson arrived, her face a mixture of worry and relief. She gave me a hug, her strong arms enveloping me like a warm blanket. It's okay, she said, her voice soft. He's gone now. You did the right thing. You were so brave. Later, my parents came home, my mom bombarded with questions I couldn't answer. I told them all I could remember, each detail replaying in my mind like a broken record. The police arrived, taking my statement, taking fingerprints, but they found nothing, left empty-handed. It was weeks before the fear began to subside replaced by a new kind of awareness. My childhood innocence, once pristine and untarnished, had been shattered, leaving behind a sliver of fear and forever altering my perspective. Years passed, and the incident became a whispered story, a cautionary tale told to younger children. My parents never let me forget, reminding me of my bravery, the intuition I had listened to, the decision I had made. I was a child, but I knew— with a certainty that still echoes in my mind, that something was terribly wrong. Sometimes, I wonder about the man. Do I ever think of him? I can't deny it. The image of his face, the unsettling smile, the frantic look in his eyes, flashes in my mind, a chilling reminder, a ghostly shadow of a close call. I wonder, did he ever find another victim? Did he continue to prey on others? Or maybe, his desperate flight that day marked the end of his reign of terror. There are no answers, only questions, and the chilling certainty that in the darkest corners of the world, there are monsters waiting in the shadows, ready to strike. And you never know, until you look them in the eye, who they might be. The incident, years later, still lingers in my mind, a stark reminder of the fragility of childhood innocence, the power of intuition, and the courage to fight for your own safety. It's a story that I carry with me, a constant, quiet companion. A reminder that the world is a complex place, where good and evil constantly dance, where shadows lurk, and where even the simplest things, like a package delivered on a sunny day, can hold a sinister secret. The salty wind whipped my hair across my face, the sting of the spray a familiar companion. The sun, a fiery red ball dipping below the horizon, cast long shadows across the beach. Here, on the desolate expanse of Haunting Beach in Texas, the world seemed to exhale, hushed and still. It was the kind of quiet that held secrets, whispers carried on the breeze. I had been venturing deeper and deeper into the beach's heart with each visit, 
drawn by a sense of unease, a phantom pain in my soul that the vast emptiness of the shore seemed to soothe. On this particular day, I stumbled upon an abandoned campsite. It was a strange, almost ethereal sight, tucked away in a twisted, gnarled patch of seaweed, a place that should have been untouched, yet it spoke of fleeting human presence. A small, faded tent slumped against a driftwood log, its canvas torn and windswept. A fire pit, overgrown with sand, held the remnants of a forgotten fire, charred twigs and blackened rocks whispering tales of a crackling flame, a fleeting moment of warmth in the vast coldness. A knapsack lay open, its contents scattered, a worn compass, a half-empty water bottle, a notebook with weathered pages. I felt an inexplicable pull, a need to delve into the mystery of the abandoned campsite. As I leafed through the notebook, the pages revealing scrawled notes of a lost soul seeking solace in the vastness of the ocean. But the final entry was a stark, scribbled warning. Don't let the ocean take you. The water is cold, and the things that dwell within are not your friends. The eerie silence of the beach was shattered by a sudden, chilling gust of wind. The mist, a swirling, ethereal curtain, began to roll in from the sea, shrouding everything in a veil of spectral gray. I shivered, the air growing thick and heavy, the ominous feeling of being watched settling around me like a shroud. Panic rose in my throat as a cold, clammy hand grasped my arm, dragging me toward the water. I spun around, ready to scream, but there was nothing there. Just the swirling mist and the constant, rhythmic crashing of the waves, a haunting melody that seemed to mock my fear. The grip tightened, pulling me towards the dark water. I fought desperately, clawing at the sand, my fingernails digging into the soft, yielding earth. I screamed, my voice lost in the roar of the wind and the relentless crashing of the waves. Suddenly, the grip vanished. I lay sprawled on the sand, gasping for breath, my heart pounding against my ribs. The mist, heavy and oppressive, clung to my skin. I tried to rise, but fear held me rooted to the spot. A shadow, elongated and grotesque, moved through the mist. It shifted and stretched, taking the form of a towering creature with inky black eyes that seemed to burn into my soul. I screamed again, a desperate, strangled cry that echoed through the mist. It was then I saw her. A woman, her hair the color of seaweed, and her eyes shimmering with an eerie green light. She emerged from the mist, walking slowly towards me, her movements as fluid and graceful as the tide. She stopped before me, her eyes fixed on mine. You shouldn't be here, she said, her voice a soft whisper that seemed to travel straight to my bones. This place is not meant for the living. Fear threatened to paralyze me, but I found my voice. Who are you? I stammered. What happened to the people who were here? She smiled, a smile that didn't reach her eyes, the sea took them. It always does. The ocean has a way of claiming what belongs to it. Her lips curved into a cruel mockery of a smile. But the sea has a purpose for you, too. A purpose that you haven't quite understood yet. My blood ran cold. I was trapped, and snared in a web spun by the ocean itself. The mist thickened, swirling around us, shrouding the woman in a veil of ghostly white. But I could still see her eyes, burning with an intensity that chilled me to the core. The water is cold, she whispered again, her voice a chilling reminder and the things that dwell within are not your friends. With a final, chilling laugh that echoed across the desolate beach, she turned and vanished into the mist. I was left alone, huddled on the sand, the cold grip of the sea still clinging to my soul. I stumbled back to my car, my body trembling, my mind racing with a multitude of questions. Who was that woman? What was her purpose? And what was the sea's purpose for me? Back in the safety and warmth of my car, I tried to rationalize the experience. Was it fatigue, the isolation of the beach, a trick of the light? Could I have imagined it all? But the memory of the touch, the cold, clammy sensation on my skin, was too vivid, too real. And the warning, the ominous words of the woman, they lingered in my mind like a shadow, a constant, haunting reminder of the darkness that lurked beneath the surface of the seemingly peaceful ocean. The following days were a blur of restless nights and haunting dreams. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, that I was being watched, followed. 
I felt a constant pull towards the sea, a magnetic force drawing me back to that abandoned campsite. One afternoon, I found myself standing on the shore again, the sun already beginning its descent behind the horizon. The air was thick with the scent of salt and seaweed, a heavy, almost suffocating aroma. The wind whispered secrets in my ears, and I felt the presence of something unseen, something powerful. Suddenly, a shiver ran down my spine. I turned, my heart pounding in my chest, and there she was. The woman from the mist. She was closer this time, her eyes fixed on me, a chill running down my spine. You're back, she said, her voice a soft whisper that seemed to travel straight to my bones. Who are you? I asked again, this time my voice trembling with a mixture of fear and fascination. She smiled, a slow, predatory smile that did not reach her eyes. I am the ocean, she said, her voice a symphony of whispering waves. And you, you are my chosen one. The words hung in the air, heavy and suffocating. I was chosen by the ocean. But chosen for what? She extended her hand, her fingers long and slender, her skin pale and translucent like moonlight. Come, she beckoned. The sea awaits you. I hesitated, my mind torn between fear and an inexplicable sense of destiny. This wasn't the first time the ocean had pulled me towards its depths. Ever since I was a child, I'd felt a strange pull towards the sea. It was a longing, a yearning for something beyond my comprehension. I'd always felt a connection, a kinship, with the immensity of the ocean, its vastness mirroring the endless depths of my own soul. And now, standing on the desolate shore, I felt that connection more powerfully than ever. It was like a voice calling me, a siren song echoing within my own heart. As I reached out to touch her hand, the mist swirled around us, hiding her in a shroud of ethereal white. But I could feel her presence, a tangible force that seemed to permeate the air around me. A gust of wind whipped across the beach, and the ocean roared, its waves crashing against the shore. I felt a cold, wet hand grasp my hand, pulling me towards the water. I resisted, but my efforts were futile. It was like I was drawn to the ocean by an unseen force, my will dissolving into the vastness of the sea. As I was being pulled into the icy embrace of the water, I saw a fleeting glimpse of a city beneath the waves, shimmering with an ethereal light. And I knew, with a chilling certainty, that my life was no longer mine to control. The ocean had chosen me, and I was now part of something far greater than myself. The cold water closed around me, engulfing me in its icy embrace. The mist swirled around me, and the world faded away. As I sank beneath the surface, I closed my eyes, embracing the darkness, the cold, the immensity that was the ocean, knowing I was no longer alone. I had become one with the sea. 